Yeah, there you go. And his response, email back to her was, I love you. <laughs> And I don't know if you know much about Ernie Gray, but he really does represent our community. We're really passionate about fish. And when he says that he loves somebody, he probably loves them for, for a really good reason. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Alexander Gordon, to share
But very rapidly, the impacts became apparent. We got Atlantic salmon in the Pacific rivers. We had toxic algae blooms, water turning orange. And the elders of my community spraying their boats down, feeling their lips go numb. That, that was something they had never experienced in their lives. And then the whales left. I'm the only one that knows how those whales used to swim those inlets. This isn't knowledge that should be in a human. It should be in those whales. But they stopped coming, and the matriarchs have passed on. And so they don't know how to swim those inlets anymore. They could relearn, but they don't know right now. And uh, the farms kept getting bigger and bigger. They wouldn't allow residents to have foreshore leases. I was a single mom, a widow living in a floating house. I just wanted a legal right to tie my float to the shoreline. I went to Victoria and they said, we're not giving out land use permits for residential use anymore. A hundred years of Echo Bay, of people tying up in float houses, was gone. We became squatters overnight in our own community. I know this is not news to First Nations here, but it was news to me. It was shocking, and I didn't know how to handle it, and I crept home, and I was a squatter, always afraid of being uh, driven out. It took me 10 years to figure out that when I wrote to the government and they said, Dear Ms. Morton, there's no evidence of toxic algae blooms, of Atlantic salmon with open sores in the rivers, of vanishing salmon stocks, when they said there was no evidence, that was all they were saying. They were saying there was no evidence. So I thought, okay, I'm a biologist. I could go get that evidence. I can make it clear. And so I dropped pillow boat work and I started studying sea lice, which were, they were interesting. But I worked on sea lice for 10 years and I began to follow juvenile wild salmon through the inlets. And I began to learn about the chain of life. And I began to get a lot more respect for salmon than just eating them, realizing that as they came out of the rivers, the whole area started to bloom with life. And the same thing when they came back. They are a gift to this coast. The animals, the people, civilization set their clocks to these fish coming back. The grizzly bears, the First Nations, the kingfisher, the mergansers, the trout, but the smaller salmon. These are an energy core, power core. So, what do you do if you're in a remote community? We don't even have electricity there. And you become, you find yourself face to face with a corporation, and the government is against you. I slowly crept forward and began to unite so many people. A lot are in this room right now. Today I'm studying viruses. European viruses that are in these salmon. The government denies they're here. Uh, but you're probably eating them because it's spreading through wild fish. And we will likely lose our, our wild Pacific salmon because they're not built for European viruses. Of course, we've heard this very, very tragic tale before about what European viruses have done to this coast. Often, I feel hopeless, but then in uniting with people in this room and far beyond, I get infected with a sense of hope. And I really do know how to turn wild salmon back on. Uh, it's called the Department of Wild Salmon, and it's us. Woo -hoo -hoo. Yeah. viruses through the Fraser Watershed, in Central Coast, British Columbia, and Vancouver Island. I've sat at kitchen tables and campfires, and I've heard so much wisdom. People that know the fish, they know what's wrong with the fish, they know where the fish should go, they know, they know what the fish used to do. And I say to these people, you are the expert, and they say, oh, no, DFO is the expert. I'm like, no, you are the expert. So my hope is to Get these salmon people out of the water. 
because the wild salmon will not survive the continued assault of European viruses, of sea lice, of waste. And then get to work with the Department of Wild Salmon, all of us, counting the fish ourselves, taking samples, sending them to our lab, figuring out what's wrong with them, because all wild salmon need is for us to get out of their way strategically. We're not leaving, that's clear. But the salmon in this region swim through the city of Vancouver twice. Once when they're going to sea and once when they come back. Clearly they can live with us. So a good friend of mine, Rod Marining, uh, we were discussing the, the uh, upcoming election. He said to me, in my experience, it's the person that smiles the most that wins. He said, I, I know I'm going to be wrong with this election, but that's the way, that's the way history has gone. This person that smiles the most wins. Well, I don't know if anybody saw the debates, but Christy Clark actually smiled more than Adrian Dix. When I look at these pictures, and I see 